A city school teacher had just finished telling her third grade learners about how Jesus was crucified and placed in a tomb with a great stone sealing the opening. Then wanting to share the excitement of the resurrection, she asked, And what do you think were Jesus' first words when he came bursting out of that tomb alive? A hand shot up in the air from the rear of the classroom. Attached to it was the arm of a little girl. And leaping out of her chair, she excitedly exclaimed, I know! I know! Good, said the teacher. Tell us, what were Jesus' first words? And extending her arms high into the air, she said, Ta-da! The great and terrible day of the Lord, mentioned here in Malachi, is going to be one of those ta-da moments. It will be a time like the resurrection that will change all of history. It will be a period of time when God directly intervenes in human affairs with either judgment or blessing. I believe that the coming of Jesus Christ for the first time on this earth was one of those great and terrible days of the Lord. I believe from our scripture passage today, God through his prophet Malachi is pointing to a time 400 years from this prophecy when the Messiah, God himself, will directly intervene in human affairs. Would you pray with me, please? Lord God, we thank you for sending your son, Jesus Christ, who came into our lives to be that sacred lamb for us. And so, Lord God, now I ask that you take these words of mine, mold them, shape them any way you wish, so that they become your words, both for our hearing and our doing. In Jesus' name, amen. As we come to this last passage of Scripture in our study of the prophet Malachi, We have mined the depths of the messenger's message to the Israelite people, and I hope to us. We have learned through these four chapters of Malachi that God loves us and chooses us, that we are to give God our best in worship, that good leadership is essential to Christian growth. We have also learned that marriage is a covenant that God designed to be permanent and not to be mocked that we are to honor God with our tithes, our time, our gifts, and our presence, that we have been called to serve each other and to serve God and what is now the body of Christ. And during our last message, we learned that God truly does bring judgment upon the faithful and the unfaithful, upon the believers and the non-believers, and so we are to remain faithful to God. But in these final verses of Malachi, God gives the Israelite people both warning and promise. These last three verses in the Old Testament are God's last words to Israel for the next 400 years. From this time forward, until the coming of John the Baptist, there will be no new revelations from God to his people. This time is reminiscent of the 400 years the Israelites remained in slavery in Egypt before another revelation came from God that Moses would be their savior, the redeemer of God's chosen nation, and lead them out of slavery. And now in Malachi's time, these words will be the last from God for 400 years until John the Baptist announces the coming of the one who would lead the whole human race out of slavery to sin and death. It will be a new kind of spiritual freedom for all of humankind. In the previous verses in chapter 4, Malachi warns the people to prepare for the coming day of the Lord. Listen to what he said, For behold, the day is coming, burning like a furnace, and all the arrogant and every evildoer will be chaff. And the day that is coming will set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. For the wicked, for the unbelievers, for the sinful, it will be a day that is horrible and beyond description. Malachi writes that day will be like a burning oven and the wicked will be like burning stubble. And when that stubble hits the oven, it is burned. And when the wicked hit judgment, they are consumed. The outcome on the day of judgment for the wicked 
is complete destruction. Jesus also talks about this day in the Gospels. In Luke 12, a multitude gathers to hear Jesus. And Jesus, in his perfect knowledge of all people, knows that these people are living as if, as if this life is all that there is, and as if losing it is the ultimate calamity. Jesus knows that they are living as if there is no eternity. And you and I know people who do this now. So Jesus spoke to them about the ultimate calamity. It's not physical death. Rather, it's being cast into hell. Jesus told the crowd, But I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him who, after the killing of the body, has power to throw you into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Now that word translated hell in this verse is the Greek word Gehenna. And that word is the same word used for the city refuse dump where the fires unceasingly burn human sewer waste, the trash from the city, and the diseased bodies of the dead. For these people, it is a frightening representation of the fate that awaits those who live without God. Unless you should think that the one whom you should fear and has the power to throw you into hell is Satan, think again. Jesus is referring to his Father, who holds power over each of us on that judgment day. We know from scriptures that, that hell is truly a real place. It is a place of separation from God and all that is good. That it's a place of just punishment. And that it's a place of hopelessness. I urge you to read Luke 16. But something else we know from Scripture is that we do not have to go there. Those who confess the truth about Jesus will be saved. Jesus says this in Luke 12. I tell you, whoever acknowledges me before men, the Son of Man will also acknowledge him before the angels of God. But he who disowns me before men will be disowned before the angels of God. The coming day of judgment will be quite different for all of those who recognize the truth about Jesus Christ. And so getting back to Malachi, the prophet tells the Israelite people that they mu what they must do to prepare for the judgment day. Look at verse 4. Remember the law of Moses, my servant, even the statutes and ordinances which I have commanded him in Horeb for all Israel. Now, it might be falling on deaf ears, but Malachi, once again, calls the people to adhere faithfully to the law of Moses. It was, in fact, the law that God gave to and through Moses. In the Ten Commandments and many of the other sacrificial laws that God gave to the Israelite people, God lays out the people's duty to him and to one another. The laws were intended to serve as a mirror to the people of their sinfulness before God. But the people of Malachi's time, disheartened to God's promises, are not adhering to the laws of God, but to their own selfish desires and the influence of the pagan religions of the nations that surrounded them. Nonetheless, Malachi says, remember the law. Follow the law. And judgment day will be a day of joy and triumph for the righteous. And then a curious thing happens in the next verse. Malachi speaks of the coming of Elijah the prophet before the judgment day. Now, we know that the prophet Elijah had lived and died almost 400 years before Malachi. So Malachi's reference here is to one who will be as great as the prophet Elijah. Look at verse 5. Behold, I am going to send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. He will restore the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers so that I will not come and smite the land with a curse. We now know that Malachi's prophecy is that of the coming ministry of John the Baptist. And we know that John the Baptist came to pave the way for Jesus Listen to what the Apostle John wrote about John the Baptist in his Gospel, chapter 1. Now this was John's testimony when the Jews of Jerusalem 
sent priests and Levites to ask him who he was. He did not fail to confess, but confessed freely, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, then who are you? Are you Elijah? And he said, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, no. And finally they said, who are you? Give us an answer to take back to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? And John replied in the words of Isaiah the prophet, I am the voice of one calling in the desert. Make straight the way of the Lord. In reading verses 5 and 6 in chapter 4 of Malachi, we are faced with this question. How did Malachi get from Judgment Day in the earlier verses to Jesus' day in these verses? The theologian John Benton gives this answer. He says, There is a sense in which the last day, the day of judgment, was brought forward and broken to history in the coming of Jesus. And then he goes on to write, and, and please listen to this very carefully. When people receive or reject the Lord Jesus Christ, they are passing judgment day verdict upon themselves. In preparing people for Jesus to be revealed to the nation of the Jews, John the Baptist was preparing people for judgment day. Those who truly owned up to their sins would be looking for the Savior. And those who went on in the pretense and hypocrisy of being good enough for God by their religion would reject Jesus. And that judgment stands for all eternity. Malachi was saying to the Hebrew people, you must stop all the wicked and sinful acts you're committing now and prepare yourselves and your hearts for that great day of judgment. And for us as Christians now, the bottom line of all this is that we too must be prepared for judgment day. We must receive Christ, the work of the Savior, whose ministry is pictured and foretold by the prophet Malachi and whose life was chronicled in the Gospels. Our choice is between believing and not believing in the saving grace of Jesus Christ. Our choice is between being saved and not being saved for all of eternity. Our choice is between being in the presence of God for all time and being in the fires of hell for all time. But whatever we choose now, whatever we choose now becomes our choice on Judgment Day. Now, I could probably end my message right here, and you'd probably like that, <laughs> but I can't. The images that Malachi portrays in these last three verses of his writing, those of Moses and Elijah, conjure up a far greater image that is revealed in the New Testament, that of the transfiguration. Listen to Matthew 17. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. There he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. And just then there appeared before them Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And while he was still speaking, a bright cloud enveloped them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. And when the disciples heard this, they fell face down to the ground, terrified. But Jesus came and touched them. Get up, he said. Don't be afraid. And when they looked up, they saw no one else but Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus instructed them, Don't tell anyone what you have seen until the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. The disciples asked him, Why then do the teachers of the law say that Elijah must come first? And Jesus replied, To be sure, Elijah comes and will restore all things. But I tell you, Elijah has already come, and they did not recognize him, but have done to him everything they wished. 
In the same way, the Son of Man is going to suffer at their hands. And then the disciples understood that he was talking to them about John the Baptist. In this scene, Moses the lawgiver, the most respected leader in Jewish history, as well as Elijah, the greatest of all prophets in Jewish history, stands side by side with Jesus. And while Jesus appears with the two greatest figures in 3,000 years of Jewish history up to that point, God speaks for Peter, James, and John to hear, This is my beloved son. Listen to him. In essence, God is saying to the Hebrews, Listen to Jesus and hear him just as you would Moses and Elijah. He is as important to you as the greatest lawgiver and the greatest prophet. And with that, God established Jesus' authority to ultimately judge all of humankind, the wicked and the righteous. After this encounter, the disciples can now hear the words of Malachi echoing in their ears that Elijah had come, that is, John the Baptist, to announce the coming of the Messiah. The disciples soon realize that John the Baptist is the Elijah from prophecy and that Jesus truly is the Messiah, the Messiah, the Jesus Christ who had just stood transfigured before them with the greatest of lawgivers and the greatest of prophets. It is now going to be him who will bring them true salvation. Malachi is the last of the prophets of the Old Testament to proclaim the great day of judgment. And John the Baptist is the first in the New Testament. Both have the same message. Repent. Ask God that your sins be forgiven. Believe in the Messiah, the one to come, the author of God's salvation. Brothers and sisters in Christ, the great judgment day is approaching. And God has given you and me the warning. And God has given you and me the promise. What judgment day verdict have you passed upon yourself? To believe or not believe in Jesus Christ? To be saved or not saved? To spend eternity in heaven or in hell? You see, now you must choose. Now you must choose. Now you must choose. What is your choice? For those who wish Jesus Christ to be their Savior, would you join me in this prayer? And you can repeat after me. If everybody would bow their heads, please. And just repeat after me. Heavenly Father, I come before you now in the name of your son, Jesus. I ask you to forgive me of my sins. I ask you, Lord Jesus, to come into my heart and to be the Lord and Savior of my life. I believe that you died on the cross and shed your blood for my sins. I believe that on the third day you rose from the grave, conquering death and hell for all eternity. I accept you as my Savior and know that I will live eternally with you. Now I ask you, Lord, to create in me a strong desire to study your word and learn all I can about growing and maturing in the body of Christ. I ask it all and receive it. In the name of our precious Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.
If you today have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then let someone know. Tell them that Jesus Christ has come into your heart and that you have now passed the verdict of judgment upon yourself. Amen.